Welcome 24s. We wish we could see you and be with you together in person. As we enter into this new space and new community, we invite you to take a few moments in the separate but shared presence of your classmates. Be here together with attention to your own sense of individuality, as well as the awareness of a greater collective. The past six months have been different for each one of us. And the reality is that those differences inform not only what we may be feeling in this moment, but also the story of who we are and how we bring our whole selves to this journey. We may feel pain from injustice, grief, and disparity, while at the same time feel relief, accomplishment, and anticipation. We may feel exhausted, excited, or confused. Whatever we feel individually, in this moment, we want to invite you, if you're comfortable, to pause, to be present, to take a deep breath, to close your eyes and consider, what story do I have to tell? How does my story connect me to my classmates and my Dartmouth community? Let us carry these questions and our stories with us. We have an opportunity to shape this moment, to learn from each other, to write the next chapter of our story and our world. We are with you on the journey. It is truly my honor to be addressing you in what is the first meeting of the class. I'd just like to begin by taking a moment to thank Daveen and Khalil from the Tucker Center for their thoughtful and inspiring introduction and to encourage you to consider their invitation to take a moment to pause, to ponder, and to reflect on yourself and your relationship to the community of which you are now a part. And I would encourage you to do this not just now, and not just through your orientation period, but throughout your time at Dartmouth, whether here or at home. Hello again, I'm Catherine Lively, Professor of Sociology and Dean of the College. I first stepped foot on this campus 19 years ago, which I realize is the year that many of you were born. And I thought, this will be a great first gig as a member of the faculty. Small classes, incredibly bright students, strong community. As the years have passed, I came to realize that Dartmouth is truly a special place, a special community, comprised of some of the most interesting and compelling students and staff and faculty I've ever met. A community of scholars, this year more than ever, that are concentrated not just in Hanover, New Hampshire, but who literally span the globe. As a professor, I absolutely loved my time in the classroom, where I taught classes on identity, well-being, emotion, power dynamics, and even on the so-called hookup culture. There was really nothing I liked better than working independently with students or getting them to see the world through a sociological perspective that allowed and encouraged them to situate their own experiences within the social structures, the local cultures, and the historical moments in which they were embedded. In fact, given everything that's happening in the world, I can't think of a better time to be introducing students to sociology. That said, I also love being Dean. And the thing I enjoy the most about my current position is working with students outside of the classroom and watching them to develop not only into scholars, but also into well-rounded people whose interests may already include or grow to include dance, acapella, theater, debate, social impact work, outdoor adventures, politics, student government, advocacy, social justice, the list goes on and on. At this particular moment, there is nothing more powerful and more important than working with students, whether they're in formal leadership positions or not, to make this place and the world a little bit better than we found it. To help you develop the skills and the capacities necessary to become informed citizens global citizens and effective change makers and advocates for positive social change. With every student interaction, whether face-to-face -face or in Zoom, 
I am reminded that all of you are truly multidimensional, that you all care about many, many things, and that it is this blend of talents, interests, ideas, ideologies, and experiences that each one of us bring to the table that makes Dartmouth such a special community and such a beacon of learning, inspiration, and hope. My new student orientation colleagues shared with me some of your individual reflections on what community means. And as I read them, I got so excited about what the next years here are likely to bring. I'll just offer a few. To me, community means a safe space where one is able to grow, change, learn, make mistakes, and improve. People in a community trust each other, respect each other, and are curious about each other without prejudice. Community is the antithesis of I, a radical deconstruction of the individualized self and a moved, move towards connectedness. Community means a place where everyone gets their voices heard. Community means the connections and relationship between people that surpass any sort of physical distance, where people can trust one another, be accountable for their responsibilities, and share fun experiences together. I'll stop here because I know that you're about to hear quite a bit more about your class, and you're going to hear it in your words. I hope you enjoy this first phase of your Dartmouth career. Welcome. Greetings to the class of 2024. My name is Olivia Scott Kumquamba, and I'm a 13. This year, I've helped compile and direct the script, but really, I'm presenting to you your words. Here at Dartmouth for the past eight years, we've had the opportunity to take your admissions essays and weave a tale of who you are, where you come from, what your hopes and dreams are, and where you hope you'll go. There's so many people across campus who are excited for you to be here. We've had readers come from every department. Kathleen has made sure year after year that we're able to do this. David Pack is directing this year. Francine and Sheila have helped organize our editor, Matt Gannon, and we have an incredible cast who've all come together to help welcome you. Really, it's our privilege to take the stories of who you told Dartmouth you were and where you hope you'll go, the ways in which you'll change the world, and present them back to you. There are so many incredible people in your class. I hope that you'll enjoy every moment of getting to know them. Please enjoy your class, your words. Everyone here, from tattoos to three-piece suits, is joined by connection to spoken word. Through the creative process, we are brought together. Despite every opportunity to use language to mask our faults, sometimes we choose to expose them, committing ourselves to utter vulnerability, trusting the audience to be accepting. In these moments, we use language to stitch an emotional intimacy into a blanket of understanding. We share an unspoken camaraderie. Together in pursuit of understanding ourselves, our world, and the fluid connections that bind us. I am no stranger to labels. As a young, biracial, French-speaking, opinionated, and dark-skinned girl, I have been categorized in every single possible way. And yet, I feel as though I don't fit into any of those boxes. I am one of the cheeseheads. The youngest member of the US Olympic netball team. Black in a mostly white environment. Yes, I make eye contact and small talk when I ride Uber. I am a quadruplet. I am adopted. I have a face full of acne. A gentle giant. 6'4 with a size 15 shoe. An immigrant trans woman. A good Muslim. A Steminist. Student choir director. The only left-handed student in the class. Not just another cisgender Caucasian male with a narrowly defined gender identity. I am the son of Iranian immigrants who fled revolution, surrounded by families who fled war-torn Syria for a second chance, dancing 11 miles away from the capital of the United States of America. When strangers ask, where are you from? I tentatively respond, Southwest Alaska, the small island of Tonga, Missouri's rolling hills, Pagosa Springs, 
a minuscule town in remote New Hampshire. Born and raised in London with family deeply rooted in the heartlands of South India and Wisconsin. To be honest, I can't imagine life without my grandparents' endless cornfields or my mother's garden. The green clusters of okra, lemons hanging off the branch, and not yet ripened tomatoes all surrounding a tall, sturdy mango tree in the center. My parents chose to root their family in a place that would oppress them, but offer my sister and I ample opportunity. They are two of the 11 million undocumented immigrants. As a kid, I was convinced I was a real-life princess, and my parents were real-life superheroes. My mom even wore a cape, which I now understand was a lap coat. As the youngest in my family of five and the middle of 40 first cousins, I have been cooking for large groups my whole life. Every Thanksgiving, I suit up in my turkey speckled apron and aggressively stir my pumpkin spice batter, determined to produce the winning treat. I've been going to Salt Spring Island my whole life, spending weeks in the same cabin as generations of my family before me. Each Sunday, I help my mother prepare the puerco asado in our home in California, just as she once helped my grandmother in Maryland, and just as my grandmother once helped her own mother back in Havana. I spend my Saturdays working at my family's restaurant from 10.30 a.m. to 9.00 p.m. Despite having parents with exceptional culinary skills, the cooking gene completely skipped over me. My mom embarrassingly still packs my school lunch. My brother is severely autistic, eight years my senior, and I am his usual target. It's been five months since the last time I spoke to my sister. I do my best to reconcile the abuser with the person I loved. I did the same when my father's alcoholism evolved into full-blown drug addiction. Unlike my cousins, I do not continue living through war, spend weeks without electricity, experience prolonged hunger, or worry about access to clean drinking water. My mom left Mexico so she could place America in my scathed hands, and I have held onto this gift with the tightest grip. Education liberated me from my dooming fate as a suppressed housewife in the rural town that failed to teach my grandmother to read and overflowed my mother's adolescence with chores instead of study. or the she. The welcome just doesn't cut it. My parents' support is in the way my chores seem to magically finish themselves during my most stressful weeks. Their care is in the way my favorite fruit, mango, seems to find its way to my table during late night study sessions. I could not merely thank my parents for everything. Their support, their care, their love. When words fail, love, that oh so hard to say word, can take the form of small actions with deep meanings. I am blessed to have been born into the trials and pressures of what some may call disadvantage because it has formed me into a person that dares to dream of opportunities. ¿Qué pasó, hija? ¿Qué dijo el doctor que sucedió? After all my falls, my father has picked me up. But how can a nine-year-old explain illness to her father? No te preocupes, papi. Todo estará bien. The reality was, I did not know whether this was true. My shaky fingers typed questions into Google search bar that my doctor had yet to answer, and my mother had yet to hear. Again and again, I typed in my symptoms, my hope fading with each press of the enter key. Despite my best efforts, I have no control over my father's cancer. I'm not God, and I can finally accept this. Instead of treating my father like a patient, I'm loving him like a daughter. My grandmother's disease was the first factor that drew my interest to research neurology. I became fascinated with the nuances of memory, the strangeness of recalling age-old song lyrics while stumbling over family names. I want to be the one who studies why these things happen, to prevent more patients. I want to find cures, not treatments, cures. This is not a hero's journey. It's a survivor's journey. Courses on environmental infrastructure weren't taught at my high school, so I designed my own. I don't believe in excuses. I may be colorblind, but my world is still painted with unique colors. Math is the ultimate uniter. I relish the hype books provide me. There is an insatiable curiosity unique to my dyslexic mind. 
I have been known to sing Ed Sheeran in the shower. You can tell a lot about a person based on the water bottle they carry. The stickers on my vibrant blue hydro flask provide a glimpse of me. My favorite band Bastille, passion for national parks, and love of dogs. I have always been Muslim, Jewish, and Christian. Born a seventh generation Mormon. Yelling, tambourines, offbeat clapping, mumbled prayers. Another typical Sunday. Forced to attend by my family, I pass the hours daydreaming. I look to culture for a spiritual connection. A transcendentalist meditator. One of the 40 million Hindu pilgrims. I am agnostic. My new mantra? Open your mind. Get out of your comfort zone. Opportunities come in all forms. Funny how the smallest things can see themselves in a child's growing understanding of the world. Can the ideals you hold dear be salvaged? Must the plot be burned in soda new? Does God exist? What happens to consciousness after death? How was Tupac able to stop the hatred and corruption from consuming him whole? I don't want to play the pity card, but yes. Kids made fun of me. A lot. Poverty, immigration, disability, homelessness. It was all exhausting, but it paled in comparison to the struggle of self-acceptance. I'm at peace now, all because I survived the war against myself. I have found purpose. Passion in being honest about mental illness. Passion in writing and discovering my strengths. Each morning begins with a run, but it is no typical jog in the park. Instead of tennis shoes, I am equipped with leather moccasins. Instead of shorts and a t-shirt, I am wearing a traditional Navajo skirt and velvet blouse. On the outside, a canalda may not look tough, but it is one of the hardest transitions a young Navajo girl can go through. I have spent hundreds of hours trying to perfect techniques that basically no one understands. I've mastered positions in minute detail that most people don't even notice. At times, it's been a therapy for me. Even when I have nothing, I will always have running. Songwriting. Shakespeare. Fashion. Weaving. Writing. Fishing. Football. Nothing is more breathtaking than watching a teeny seedling sprout into a delicate plant that eventually bears glistening red tomatoes. I am at home drifting off under the stars or swaying pine boughs, rousing to watch fog spread across the lake or an eagle sweeping overhead. There is a purity to this that neither opinions nor politics can pierce. Climbing Mount Vesuvius, legs aching from the strain but enjoying it nonetheless. Swimming with hammerhead sharks in the Galapagos, the danger making it even more exciting. Teaching myself how to surf this summer, resulting in countless wipeouts. As a goalie, I am confined to the far ends of the rink, my home defined by the baby blue paint marking the crease. I am far from the bench where my teammates converse throughout the game, far from the mid-play pep talks, far from the center of team action. Alone on the ice, I must depend on myself, the positivity of my thoughts and my actions to be successful. The decision to kneel wasn't one I made lightly. I knew there would be an aftermath, but I wasn't quite prepared for the backlash. This is service in its purest form, work worth doing with a group of people you love. Whether I'm helping Harold fill in the holes at the Johnson Adult Daycare Center, envisioning a women's health center in Gitwe, Rwanda, providing homeless individuals with solar-powered cell phone chargers. What do we owe each other? Everything. Living within a society that emphasizes self-reliance, it is easy to forget that it is in a community where we find the support needed to go far. The phrase, if it's not broke, don't fix it, should apply to cars and clothing, not our country. If there's a better way to operate businesses or design buildings or analyze viruses, shouldn't we always be looking to improve? My uncle served 18 years of his life in prison for a crime he had no part in. A police officer, using a false witness, had planted evidence and only confessed to the crime in a letter in his will. The Innocence Project helped secure his release and now, I work for them. I entered for the Republican Party. Yes, I'm progressive, but my passion in life isn't to be a Democrat. My passion in life is to transform my country and community for the better. Individuals aren't singularly good or bad. 
people are more nuanced than their party affiliation. Sometimes rules need to be broken. Ask me why Mauna Kea is so sacred, and I can tell you about the breathtaking view atop the 13,000 foot mountain. I can tell you that this is the very place native Hawaiian gods, our protectors, meet and watch over us. I can tell you this Mona holds an abundance of natural resources necessary for our survival. At her base, people from other islands, states, even countries have gathered, committed to protect her from new construction. To some, conversing simply in words was enough, but at times, gesticulation and facial expressions were also required. No one gave up, no one sat in silence, everyone was heard. Everything there was slow cooked, similar to the revolution of centuries that transformed societies. But too often, our pressure cooker society prefers fast food, fast communication, and fast action. As college applications approached, my parents, desperate for financial aid, pushed me to enhance the beauty of my resume, urging me to join more clubs, volunteer more often, write a book. But these simply convey artifice. There is beauty to the unadulterated. As I think of who I am, I realize that it's not that I don't know who my character is. It's that I can't choose a single characteristic. My character is a paradox, and I am the author, silently straddling a seesaw of contradiction. Dartmouth, I suspect I will be a messy, contradictory, and ambiguous addition to your school. But I also suspect that this will be my greatest strength. Wow, 24 is your incredible class. Thank you for sharing with us and with each other. We hope to learn more about you as your time at Dartmouth goes on. We only think it's fair that you learn a little bit more about us as well. Some of our orientation peer leaders have um, come up with stories and lessons they've learned from their time at Dartmouth. Enjoy. When I look back on my freshman year, there were many points where I felt like I didn't belong. One night stands out clearly in my memory. It was Friday, people were laughing outside, and I was sitting by myself in my room because the week had been exhausting. I felt crushed because I hadn't gotten into the mock trial team and I didn't really feel like I had anyone that I absolutely clicked with. Then a song shuffled on my Spotify called Sailboat and I remember starting to cry because the metaphorical lyrics describing a sailboat lost at sea trying to find its way back home described exactly how I felt in that moment. Looking back now, I realized that a place where you belong isn't necessarily the place where you always feel happy and comfortable. A place where you belong gives you room to grow. It accepts you as you are and allows you to define yourself in ways that you may not have known, in ways outside of your academic accomplishments and your grades. So when you feel alone this year, because you might, remember that it's not always going to feel that way. Dartmouth is ready to welcome you to its community. 
but you have room to define your place here. Welcome. I think Duwani's story is an important reminder that finding a community and feeling at home won't be automatic for everyone. And that's okay. There may be some bumps in the road to finding your place here. But there are also many avenues to finding your community at Dartmouth, from your residence halls to your O-team, student clubs and organizations, to classes and academic departments, as well as places like the Office of Pluralism and Leadership, the Center for Social Impact, the College Center, Greek Life, outdoor programs, house communities and living learning communities, the Native American program and FISEP, and many, many more. As you begin to make Dartmouth a home, we encourage you to think not only about what the word home means to you and what you want in a community, but also what you can bring to and offer this community as well. The interesting thing about Dartmouth is I feel like you learn a lot from people, not just in an academic sense, but in a personal way too. During my freshman year, I suffered two pretty large personal tragedies. I wasn't sure how to deal with them when they happened, honestly. I just tried to blow past them with a smile. I wasn't very communicative in my personal issues, and I felt awkward acknowledging that sadness and that vulnerability. But I was surprised. Before long, friends could tell something's wrong, and I hesitantly decided to open up to them about what was bothering me. My Dartmouth community was there for me immediately. I learned from them what it is to be vulnerable, to lean on and be there for others, and to be okay with taking time um, for myself to heal. As you move through your first year at Dartmouth, I encourage you to let yourself be vulnerable. To be okay with not feeling okay. Things can sometimes happen in scary and unexpected ways, and when they do, it is incredibly important to let yourself grieve, to feel every emotion you need to, and to get help if you need it. Definitely make time to check on your friends and peers, but also make time to check on yourself. This year will be challenging, yes, but I just want you all to know that you are now part of a community that will do its best to support you, and will thrive on any support you can give them. Michelle, thanks so much for sharing and raising so many important points. We know that life, especially during times of transition, like going to college, in the midst of a pandemic, that a lot of times it can feel like we're on a roller coaster of emotions. And that's totally normal. In fact, feeling the whole range of emotions from unpleasant emotions to pleasant ones, low energy to high energy, that's actually part of the human experience. And what we know is if we can notice our emotions in any given moment, that they can actually act as information to let us know what we need. And when we're able to do that, it allows us to sort of learn how to surf the waves of emotions rather than being tossed around by them. And so we can do that process of checking in in a lot of different ways. One way is kind of through journaling or meditation, mindfulness, prayer. Another way would be confiding in other people, whether it's friends, family members, or mentor. And then, of course, there's the vast network of resources available to you here at Dartmouth. Places like the Counseling Center, the Tucker Center, the Student Wellness Center. We all have one-on-one -on -one services that allow you to just talk through whatever life is giving to you at that moment. We also have opportunities for students to connect with each other, um, to learn skills around how to be well in this world through things like reflection, connection with others, um, and intentional action. So I guess the point is emotions matter. <laughs> and we know actually from research that they can impact things like attention, memory, and learning. Those are all pretty important for school. We also know that they have a big connection with things like our mental health and our physical health. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mariana to talk a little bit about a time that her physical health maybe gave her some challenges while she was here at Dartmouth. Hi, I'm Mariana. I'm a 23 and I spent most of my freshman fall without a voice, literally. I spent the summer before my freshman fall painfully waiting for my life to start. I distinctly remember most of the upperclassmen I came in contact with as I gleefully explored campus during O week, telling me to take care of myself and relating stories of physical, emotional, and mental hardship during their freshman fall. Thinking, well, I never get sick, I blithely disregarded their advice. I got a fever the first week of classes. I lost my voice the second week, and I remained sick the entire rest of the term. After missing three weeks of coursework, the fear of completely failing all of my courses led me to my first year dean. It was the beginning of a cherished mentor relationship and friendship. 
My dean reached out to me toward the end of week seven. I was still sick, not sleeping, and without a voice, and talked to me about how I could end my term with academic success. She spoke with my professors, my counselors, and even my parents, and we developed a plan. I was ultimately able to complete the term successfully from home because I com communicated my needs and worked with my dean and professors. But uncertainty riddles the world we live in. But I trust my deans when they reach out with information, whether it is simply checking in or is just reminding me to keep moving forward. There are certainly things that frustrate me about Dartmouth. But one thing that I love is that it gives students the opportunity to change and mold the school for the future. I am so excited for you to join us 24s and feel the magic of being part of the Dartmouth community. As you check in with yourself, you may find there are times this year when you can't handle things alone. Mariama's story highlights two groups in particular who are here to support you if you're experiencing challenges. The first is where I work, the undergraduate dean's office. Your undergraduate dean offers holistic advising on academic, personal, and social matters throughout a student's entire time at Dartmouth. We understand that you are a student, but also a person. If challenges come up outside of the classroom, we are here to help. Examples may include illness, family circumstances, finding and maintaining motivation, balancing lots of responsibilities, just to name a few. We can help students consider their course combinations, explore the curriculum, review academic requirements, and discuss educational goals, summer opportunities, career aspirations, and extracurricular interests. First year deans would be available during drop-in hours this week, and we encourage you to connect with your dean early in the fall term. Another important resource when you are finding it hard to handle things yourself, for example, being seriously ill, is the Dartmouth College Health Services in Dix House. DCHS offers a full range of medical services from primary care to counseling and is available to all enrolled Dartmouth students. Whether you are on campus or learning from a distance, both Dix House and the undergraduate dean's office and the many Dartmouth resources we've named already are here to support you. Junior spring is meant to be a time for reconnection on campus with classmates after many students study abroad or take internships through the fall and winter. Last spring, however, reconnection became the word we associated with waiting for our Zoom to load. Not something I would be able to achieve during a remote term. But despite all the in-person interactions I missed in the spring, I also received the opportunity to actually connect with the people in my classes more than before. This spring, I took part in a collaborative research seminar, Experiments in Politics, in which the 16-person class engaged in a term-long group project with frequent mini-group assignments and a hyperactive Slack channel. In a term on campus, we might have engaged in discussion during class and gone our separate ways, but in the Zoom world, our professor would leave the Zoom room open after class and make one of us host so we could stay and chat. Group projects became friend groups. Just last week, one of my spring project brainstorm groups, since turned into a group chat, spent an hour and a half catching up over the phone. Virtual office hours with professors became oases, as both my professors and I dug into deeper conversations, putting in thoughtful work to get to know me. So don't worry if you're feeling alone or vulnerable starting classes remotely. We all do. And that presents a unique opportunity to form lasting friendships, even if it's not how you pictured it. You're all working through this remote sphere together, and I'm confident that if you put in genuine effort and remain open-minded, you will be able to connect in classes through the material and beyond. There's that phrase, turning lemons into lemonade. And we certainly have gotten a truckload of lemons dropped on us especially the last few months. But what I loved about Justin's story is that even in the sourest of times, there can be real opportunity and growth. We may just need to retrain our brains a little bit to notice the hidden gems in our days, in our term, in our weeks, in our year. 
And so at the Student Wellness Center, we offer monthly themes to help people do just that, think about things a little differently. And over the summer, we picked joy and playfulness. I know, a bit odd during these times, but we picked it for just that reason, to try to encourage people to notice the little cracks of light in their day, to help sustain ourselves through these kind of heavy times we may be experiencing. As we shift into fall, we're focusing on the theme of resilience and flexibility in hopes to offer the chance to be thinking about how, what are we learning in this moment about ourselves and how we interact with each other? How are we able to think about our circumstances in creative ways? And also, how can we adapt in ways that we never thought possible? So let's remember that individually and collectively, we are growing in ways that ultimately will make us stronger, kind of like thriving pines. I decided to come to Dartmouth because of its community. As a first year, I looked to build relationships with my floor mates, my classmates, people in my acapella group, and students I met around campus. I was excited by how open both first years and older students were to meeting new people and making new friends. During fall term, I was so focused on the other students of Dartmouth that I didn't even realize how much Dartmouth's community extends beyond the students. When I came back from winter break, I frequented office hours with my public policy professor. I wanted to learn how I could best improve my writing in the class. When I went to meet with him, the first thing he did was ask me about myself and my interests. My professor wanted to get to know me, and in turn, I got to learn more about him, including his work and his interest in policy. Later that term, my acapella group sang at a local library during a memory cafe event for local residents with Alzheimer's and other memory challenges. As someone who worked in an assisted living home and who grew up with grandparents always living with me, singing with a number of senior citizens who are our neighbors really made Hanover feel like home. This past spring and summer have been filled with uncertainty and change. Removed from campus, I was sure all I had were my few close friends from school. I was wrong. As I reached out to my dean, my professors, and the program director of my living learning community, each one supported me the best they could. They may not have always had answers, but they were there for me, listening to my concerns and advising me. I have been most thankful for the Dartmouth community during this tumultuous time. Everybody's slice of Dartmouth is different, but I have found no matter how far I am from the people that make up my Dartmouth community, I can always count on their being there for me and close in spirit. I think Uma has raised a really good point and one that is particularly salient this year. The community at Dartmouth extends beyond the boundaries of our campus at Hanover. It stretches to the homes of faculty and staff throughout the Upper Valley, to our neighbors we see at college events and in town. In fact, it extends all around the world with many of you joining our community from afar this year. In my office in Collis, we support students as they work to impact the college community through student organizations and programs. In the Center for Social Impact, the staff spends a lot of time with students thinking about the impact they want to have on the community, both locally and globally, through experiential engagement in the Upper Valley and beyond. One of the most important ways we'll all have an impact this year is by doing our part to protect this community, both students, faculty, and staff, and our Upper Valley neighbors, by committing to best practices in illness prevention that we've established for our community. We know from surveys you filled out before coming that you already care about people around you and have been practicing recommended public health guidelines to protect yourself and others. So please continue to do your part to keep our community safe by continuing to practice physical distancing, wearing your mask, and washing your hands regularly. And I'm optimistic that we have a chance as a community to be in this place together in responsible ways. We have one last OPL story to share. Olivia's poem captures the duality of the face we show our classmates and the world, alongside the swirl of emotions, experiences, and stories we are living behind the scenes. Yes, this is where I want to go to college. Never set foot in the state, never seen the campus. I want to do medicine. Withdrawals from Bio 13 first winter term decides they don't want college to be a stress hole takes way too many sociology classes, but loves their schoolwork. I know nobody. Oh well. Gets along with their first year roommate fine. Their first floor roommates are cool. Spends the first two weeks eating with random people each meal. 
Hi, is this seat taken? Can I sit here and chat? Cool. Finds a lot of one-shot interesting convos, finds a few lasting friends, finds eventual partner. I like to talk to everyone. Finds support in their house community staff, the custodial staff, in DDS, in professors, with the bike mechanics, the unlikely places. This is hard. Learns to deal with anxiety, with toxicity, with stress, identity questions. But you know, I'm thriving. But floating duck syndrome is real, but sometimes I forget commitments, but I know people who aren't thriving. I'm okay. Because it's okay to be unwell. Because I'm happy with my choices. Because I have agency. Because I have a support system. It is our hope that you will each build a support system that will carry you through the highs and lows of your time at Dartmouth. And I know everyone you've seen in this program is committed to helping you do that so that you can write your own Dartmouth story. So we've now heard some words from you, as well as words from some OPLs and college faculty and staff. And throughout orientation, you'll hear many more words, all important to your transition to Dartmouth. But as we draw toward the conclusion of this first meeting of the class of 2024, we have a few more folks who want to share one important word. Welcome. What are we doing? I'll edit this part out. You so. need to be like on your level. Then we all say welcome 24s. Everyone say welcome 24s. I think so. It's down. <laughs> Three, two, welcome 24s. Welcome, welcome home 24s. Welcome to Dartmouth. Welcome. welcome. Welcome 24. Be safe and have a great year. Welcome to the amazing class of 2024. We can't wait to have you on campus soon. I can't wait to interact and learn with you. Can't wait to cheer you on. Go Big Green! We are so excited to meet you. You guys definitely belong here. Welcome to Dartmouth from the Office of Greek Life. Welcome to the Big Green 24s. We can't wait to see you at Luz. We're so glad you're here. Come out to the O Farm and help us harvest this fall. Welcome to Dartmouth 24s. I hope you have a wonderful year. Hey 24s, welcome to the Dartmouth family. We're so excited to have you. Class of 2024, welcome to Dartmouth College. Welcome 24s. Welcome class of 2024. We're so lucky to have you. Welcome to Dartmouth 24s, we can't wait to meet you. Hi 24s, welcome to Dartmouth. Welcome from the undergraduate dean's office. Woo! Hi 24s. Welcome to the class of 2024. Yay! Welcome. I'm the Pepper Center. Welcome home 24s. Stay well, stay safe. Hey 24s, welcome to Dartmouth. Welcome 24s, I look forward to meeting you. Welcome from the Gracia Center. Welcome to Dartmouth. We can't wait to meet you. Welcome to Dartmouth College. The College Center staff looks forward to meeting you. From the Office of Pluralism and Leadership, welcome 24s. Welcome to Dartmouth Class of 2024. Hey 24s, can't wait to meet you. Welcome home 24s. Welcome, welcome. to the Class of 2024 from the Irving Institute for Energy and Society. Welcome to Dartmouth, we're so glad you're here. Welcome from Dartmouth Dining. Welcome to Dartmouth 24s. Welcome to Dartmouth. 24s, we love you. Welcome home. Welcome to Dartmouth College. Welcome to Dartmouth. We're so excited to meet you. You are the best class ever. Welcome 24. What's up 24s? Welcome to Dartmouth. Welcome to Dartmouth. Welcome to Dartmouth 24s. Welcome 24s. Welcome to Dartmouth. Welcome to Dartmouth 24s. Welcome to Dartmouth. Welcome 24s. Welcome to Dartmouth. Welcome Welcome 24. 24s. 24s. <laughs>As you can see, we're all very excited that you are joining the Dartmouth community wherever you might be. To close our program, members of Dartmouth's many a cappella groups will lead us in the singing of the alma mater. Lyrics are included so you can begin to learn and sing along. Dear old Dartmouth, give a rose for the cottage on the hill. For the old pine above her and the loyal ones who love her. Give a rouse, give a rouse with a will for the sons of old Dartmouth, for the daughters of Dartmouth. Though round the girdled earth they wrong a spell on their remains, they have the silver in their hearts.